So the word that st stuck out in my mind this week with our gospel was the word foundation. You know, when I was a teenager, I thought my parents were just so goofy. Like, why did they make us go to church every Sunday? I couldn't see it. I mean, I thought, what's wrong with skipping a week? But not in my house. You only missed, you only missed church if you were really, really sick. But then you couldn't go outside the rest of the day. Don't even ask to go outside. Don't ask to do anything. Well, you know, when I grew up to have children of my own, I came to see that my parents weren't lame as I thought, that they pretty much knew everything. They knew what was good for me, and they knew to lay a foundation of faith for me. When I came to have children of my own, it was important that they go to church, not to just go to the building on Sunday, but I wanted them to know the love of Jesus and that when they felt alone and they felt like they had no hope, that they have God. God is, gosh, I can't even describe the love, but I want to them to know how important God was in my life, how important God was in their father's life, and why we do what we do. You know, sometimes I wondered if the seeds that I was planting, and I know that you talked about seeds last week, but I almost feel like I can't talk about the foundation without kind of putting in seeds. We, we plant these seeds in our children. And I'm sure my parents thought the same about us. Would the seeds take when they go off to have a life of their own? Would, would the seed have grown? And it, and it has. I think the same thing for my children. I planted and I built a firm foundation. But would they come to seed on their own? I can't lead them to it. You know, you might know a friend or somebody who you hope that they, you want them to know Jesus, but I've come to know this, that it's not in my time, that it's in God's time. And we lay the foundation for them and hope that these seeds and this foundation is a strong one. I know I smile now that I see my own daughter bring her daughter to church. And many of you, I've only been in this congregation for nine years, but I've come to see some children who've been sitting with their, fam their families who now have families of their own, and they're laying the foundation. When we sing these hymns like, I need thee, we lay the foundation. When we sing so many of these beautiful hymns that we have, we lay the foundation for our children. We have yet another beautiful song called Jesus Firm Foundation. Let's, let's. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building on it. Each builder must choose with care how to build on it, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Did you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If you think that you are wise in this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. So let no one boast about human leaders, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or present or the future. All belong to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Thank you. With a Bible reading that... Bella read for us this morning, we come to the conclusion of Paul's opening remarks in his letter to the Corinthians. He tells the people, I have shown you the sure foundation. Now build upon it. Your life as a child of God, your life together as church. Paul uses a lot of different metaphors throughout these opening three chapters. And you might remember how he likened himself to a nursing mother 
who provides the necessary spiritual milk for the believers to mature in faith. Paul reminded the Corinthians that when a person goes under the waters of baptism, their life is identified with the death of Jesus. And when they're raised out of their baptismal waters, their life is identified with the resurrection of Jesus. We can be sure of forgiveness. We can be sure of this relationship that will last into eternity. Paul contrasted human foolishness to divine wisdom. To the world, the death of Jesus displayed weakness and invalidated his teaching. However, Paul explained that by yielding to human sin and violence and not retaliated, Jesus defeated the same. And by rising from the dead, there is a little one looking for grandma. There we go. Jesus defeated sin, defeated violence. And by rising from the dead, Jesus displayed the paradoxical power of the cross, the wisdom of God. And Paul depicted cross-formed people as those who want to learn how to love their neighbor. Whether such persons are known or unknown, friendly or not. While the following refrain is from another letter Paul wrote, it aptly summarizes what Paul has just finished telling the Corinthians. Have among yourselves the same attitude that is also yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to grasp. Rather, he emptied himself taking the form of the slave, coming in human likeness, and found in human appearance, he further humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Jesus is our model for a life built upon the foundation of merciful love. It is a life where one practices self-emptying, and responds to the love we receive from Jesus by attending to the well-being of persons marginalized, spurned, or forgotten by the society around us. It is a very different life than the one that emerges from the foundation of wanting to make a name for yourself, where attitude and behavior exhibit boasting, seizing, hoarding, dominating. And having revealed what is the sure foundation, Paul now shifts from being a provider of spiritual milk to becoming a life coach. But before addressing the problems as coach, he makes one further comment about this foundation. Let each carpenter who comes on the job take care to build on the foundation. Remember, there is only one foundation, the one already laid, Jesus Christ. Take particular care in picking out your building materials. Eventually, there's going to be an inspection. If you use cheap or inferior materials, you'll be found out. When I served in Charleston, a neighboring congregation received an endowment to enlarge their pipe organ. The project began by the workers opening up the chamber holding the pipes. And that's when the project came to an abrupt halt. For what was discovered when they exposed the external wall was a crack going from the peak all the way to the ground. The engineer 
called in to examine the structure, immediately declared the building unsafe for occupancy. There was virtually no foundation sustaining this massive and magnificent church building. Back in the 19th century, when the building was constructed, they put palmetto logs on the soft mud. And then on top of the palmetto logs, they piled rocks. Well, the high water table and soft earth even deteriorated the rot-resistant palmetto woods. And as the wood gave way, the rocks sunk deep into the mud. There was virtually no foundation holding up the building. It was on the verge of collapse. Those engineers spent two years, and the congregation spent $18 million resetting a foundation and repairing the building. Both buildings and human lives need a sure foundation. Jesus used this image as metaphor to compare what happens when persons who absorb and put into practice his teaching and what happens to persons who do not. Again, I read from the Message Bible. These words I speak to you, Jesus said, are not incidental actions to your life, homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundational words, words to build a life upon. If you work these words into your life, you are like a smart carpenter who built his house on solid rock. Rain poured down, the river flooded, big winds hit, but nothing moved that house. But if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work it into your life, you are like a stupid carpenter who built his house on the sandy beach. When a storm rolled in and the waves came up, it collapsed like a house of card. A month ago, this sermon series began with this observation. Christianity in America is not working well. We live at a time when our culture places so much value on achieving fame, power, wealth, and such pursuits are just as common among Christians as they are among society as a whole. And to a large extent, that is why a majority of young adults and teens no longer consider Christianity relevant. Some go far as to say the institutional church is as much as the problem than any offering of, or solution it might add. In essays, Facebook, blog posts, this generation expresses how for them the church is a turnoff. Why? Because they perceive the institutional church as being judgmental, exclusionary, impractical, ineffective, as hostile towards most science and showing little regard for the environment, as silent when people not like them experience injustice, as lacking compassion for the plight of refugees trying to flee violence, as wanting to get close to the seat of power, but forgetting that Jesus focused upon the least of these. Now, of course, there are examples where the church continues to be the heart in hand conveying the presence and mercy of Jesus. And many of those examples are found right here at Freedens. It's a joy to be with you in the kind of heart we have. But sadly, 
These examples stand out because they're not the norm. Again, I cite the quote from G.K. Chesterton. Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and not tried. So it is well for us to ask, upon what foundation are we building our lives? A while back, I heard on the Diane Rehm show a noted historian being interviewed. The man had written several acclaimed biographies. Rehm asked her guest, how did he begin his research? To which he replied, by examining the person's ledger and daily diary. He went on to explain By learning how the person both spent his money and his time allowed the biographer to understand the foundation upon which this person lived her life. What held value? What gave inspiration? What influenced everyday relationships and decisions? So again, where is your life invested? What do we, a congregation whose name means peace, what do we value and pursue? And how might we arrive at our best understanding of God's preferred future and pursue it? Allow me to push that question further. Parents, grandparents, special adult friends, When children observe your life, what do they learn? And you whose life work is providing service, while it may be inappropriate to talk about faith, what do your students, your patients, your clients experience through an interaction with you? And for any of us, when something goes wrong and we have to register a complaint, What does the other person experience? Is it truth spoken in love? Now, I don't pose these questions to cast dispersion. If anything, they arise from my own failure to build my life on Jesus. Oh, I talk each week about a life founded in Jesus, but have to admit too many occasions I try to impress others and make a name for myself. I know what it's like to tilt so far that relationships and pursuits collapse because the foundation was poor. And sadly, the consequences affected others. In the year 1205, Francis of Assisi went on a spiritual pilgrimage in order to discern how God wanted to work through his life in the movement he began. During a time of contemplative prayer, he heard Jesus tell him, Francis, rebuild my church, for you see it is falling in ruin." I believe the Lord is once again calling all who listen to rebuild his church from the bottom up, from the local congregation to denominational leadership, from having a mind of Christ to our everyday relationships and activities. I'm not speaking about a program to attract new members, or efforts to raise giving. Rather, it is being attentive to the same concern expressed by the psalmist when he prayed, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. 
See if there is anything that offends you, and then lead me according to your everlasting way. What I propose this morning is that we take steps during Lent to ask the Lord to check out our foundation and ignite our hearts. The ask may require a change in your weekly routine, but the reason is right and the promise is certain. Let us make it our resolve to obtain a copy of the Lenten devotion and use it each day to reflect upon Scripture and its implication for our lives. To gather for the midweek meal and prayer service that so united in fellowship and worship we can open our lives to what God wants to accomplish in and through us. And to begin each day committing our lives to the Lord and asking for the ability to see the place where we are called to act kindly to someone else. Through these practices, and even through whatever disruption it may cause for you, God is going to work, searching our hearts, resetting the foundation, and building our lives so we would have a mind like Christ. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are the sure foundation. And and we look at the way you live and wonder, how could we ever? And you still say to us, follow me. Lord, you know those places where we wrestle. You know the concerns that, oh, weigh heavily upon us. Heal us. Reset our foundation. Ignite our hearts that built upon the foundation of your life and your love. We would be for the world a presence of your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.